Yes, hello and welcome. It's another Confessions podcast. Thank you for downloading another audio array of terrible tales from that increasingly sinful Radio 2 listener. Anyway, they're after some forgiveness. Don't think they're going to get much. This week we feature a precariously perched peck trainer, a flabbergasting foreign faux pas, the misgivings of a master menagerie malingerer. That's very good. And a silky shirty souvenir. Not quite so good. But anyway, uh, the tales are good. Here they are. Tonight's comes from Gaz, who's in Greece. That's Gaz in Greece. So, Simon and the Collective, I'm seeking forgiveness for an incident that happened late one Saturday night in 1975, when I was a tall and callow and somewhat plump youth of 14. That is relevant, by the way. As was often the case in those distant days, the small adverts at the back of the Sunday newspapers were a great source of inspiration and curiosity for the average family. And so it came to pass that my father decided to purchase a muscle-building device called a bullworker. You remember bull workers? Oh, we all remember them, yes. <laughs> That's a boy question. I, remember, I don't know, Rebecca and Bobby are too young to remember the bull worker. I remember I a bull worker. Do you? Being around, yeah. Yeah, OK, just checking. Anyway, this was, of course, endorsed by the late, great Charles Atlas in an attempt to, A, use up some unused green shield stamps, and, B, make me a little bit fitter and as interested in sports as my two older brothers, so this is why it was purchased. The said device arrived and basically consisted of two pieces of steel tube that fitted snugly within each other with a plastic handle at each end and a clever series of springs and steel wires which enabled it to be either compressed or stretched in order to build muscles just like Charles Atlas. A huge sheet of suggested exercises accompanied the device and my dad uttered the fateful words, Right, lads, let's see what you can do with that to myself and my brothers. I promptly ignored the device and continued with my usual hobbies of reading and scoffing spangles. <laughs> As was customary in those days, my parents used to go to the local pub on Saturday evening along with a group of friends to drink double diamond baby shams and sing along to the local organist and his open mic. And after last orders, all land up in one of the gang's homes to continue the party. Yeah? Yeah. That sounds... No, yeah, yeah, yeah everyone did that. grass, I think. No, anyway, what? on the fateful Please. night in question, my parents and their gang returned to our house after the pub had closed. I was the only occupant of the house as my elder siblings were out with girlfriends. Amongst the gang of about 12 slightly tipsy adults that arrived were, let's call them Desmond and Margaret. Margaret always stood on the left of Desmond as he had lost the sight in his right eye, thus he could always see where she was. After more drinks had been poured and a round of cheese and ham sandwiches passed round, my dear father uttered more dreaded words. Right, son, where's the bull worker? <laughs> Obviously. Yeah, where's the bull worker? Because yeah. that's going to be entertaining on a Saturday night. You can show this lot what you've learned, he says. <laughs> I reluctantly collected the unused and dusty device from under my bed and brought it down to the living room and watched with dread as it was passed around amongst the men who all seemed immensely strong and able to compress and or stretch it to its limits in a display of beer fueled manliness. Eventually it was passed to me, its handles slick with manly perspiration and I grasped it in my sweating hands and in a flash of inspiration remembered the exercise that seemed to me about the easiest on the instruction chart. Right, just watch this then, I say nervously as I grasped firmly the base in my hands and shoved the other end into the top corner of the living room door. I started pushing upwards and was amazed to see the tensioning wires going slack as the tubes concertinaed inside each other. As the ladies present began to applaud my 14-year-old machismo, I made the fatal mistake of looking at the gathering of friends and the top handle of the almost fully compressed bulwarker slipped from the doorframe, allowing the stored energy within it to propel it, propel it across the living room at head height like a steel rocket. The missile somehow managed to miss everyone except Margaret, who it hit in the jaw like a punch from John oh, Conte, what? immediately knocking her over and out. Imagine the commotion as everyone started checking her out and her husband Desmond started turning around in circles going, Marge? Marge, where are you? Are you on my blind side? I can't see you. The birds and stars circling Margaret's perfectly coiffured head eventually faded, but after I had quietly slinked off to bed and lay there laughing as quietly as I could, the device was later spotted in a local second-hand shop on sale for £3.50. So I desperately need your forgiveness 
First of all from Margaret for knocking her out with a bulwarker, Desmond for making him think that she'd vanished, and also from the bulwarker company for locally tarnishing the brand of their fitness and muscle building machine. P.S. I eventually got fit. I don't miss the bulwarker, but I do miss Spangles. That's what, well, he's in Greece. Do they sell Spangles in Greece? I'm sure he can get them sent over. I probably can. If, if they're still there. Anyway, Gaz, thank you very much indeed. I don't think we've had a bulwarker uh, confession, but you can just imagine it's going to be uh, a recipe for disaster pushed up against the door, then the focus drift shoots off across the room. Poor Margaret gets it in the jaw. She's perfectly fine, of course, in the long run. Yeah, but it sounded pretty serious for her on the night. I mean, she could have had some serious damage no, she was fine. done to her. Being She's hit fine. by one end of a bulwarker doesn't sound great, does she it? Was she, was she was fine. She was she absolutely was fine. fine. You okay, need to know. She was fine. that's she was... what you say, then I'll accept it. I think it wasn't uh, Gaz's fault. It was the fault of the, first of all, Gaz's dad for wanting to show off uh, about how strong his son was. Yes, and secondly, parenting. the fact that uh, the handles were all sweaty. Disgusting. <laughs> but anyway, that it's not his fault that they were all sweating all over the handle and it slipped out of his grip. So, uh, for those reasons, I'm going to forgive. Very bad parenting, that's what I think. I think you're absolutely right. Here comes Bobby, though. It's difficult, though, isn't it? Because it's the user's responsibility to make sure that the environment is safe for use. So, having said that... Not he in was, the 70s, it wasn't. Well, yeah, I know, it's difficult in the 70s, and, it's, and he was only 14, and it seemed like these drunk parents had come home and invaded his quiet space. He was happily reading something, I don't know, Enid Blyton, eating Old English Spangles, and they come and trashed it and made him perform like a performing monkey. That is, a, that um, is true, you know, though. He have, he's not reading Enid Blyton. When he's 14, though, is he? Is he not? Okay. Um, Anyway, what I would say, I don't know what he's reading, but I would say is you're absolutely forgiven. It's your dad's fault, really, for making you perform to entertain his mates. You're forgiven. Actually, I've got a good idea what he was reading. <laughs> yes, Secret <am> Seven. <laughs> yes, of course, that's yeah, right. Exactly he what he was reading. Yeah. Secret yeah. Seven. Oh, uh, certain, uh, yeah, anyway, Matt, what do you say to Gaz and uh, Greece? Well, loads of 70s references in this. Double Diamond, Spangles, John Conte. We've, it's a long time since we've had him yes. involved in the confessions. I make it a life <laughs> lesson to, at any point, if I'm at a party and someone says, go and fetch the bull worker. That's the point where I ring a cab and leave. Uh, because Not when you're 14, you don't. No, you, you, after I ring the cab and go, Go, go to a friend's house because I'm not getting involved in any party that involves a bull worker after we've all had a little bit too much to drink. Um, so for that reason, I am going to forgive. Yep, <laughs> perfect sense that you're fine. Jack the accountant is responsible for tonight's confession. Thank you, Jack the accountant. Does this have a PG certificate? Oh, excellent. P- 12A. Lovely. PG. Too late to do that now. PG. People are going to be not 12A. switching off. 15. 15? No, it's not 15. We don't oh, do that. Oh, I say. It's not X-rated. PG slash 15. Jack the Accountant. My story said in the 1980s, Simon, when I was a 10-year-old schoolboy... However, my guilt has only been with me in my adult years, as at the time my actions felt perfectly normal and gave me no reason to feel shame or remorse. It's the summer holidays, long warm days of playful endeavour in Yorkshire, climbing trees, chasing cats, falling off our bikes. My father would normally take a week off during August. We, that's mum, dad and my younger brother Chris, would go to Rill or Harrogate and once we went to Westwood Ho, which seemed like a very long way in the Morris Minor. But this year, well... We were off and on a ferry. We drove to New Haven, we crossed the Channel and arrived excitedly in Dieppe. I don't remember too much about the drive to the south of France, but it took a couple of days. In-car entertainment was pretty much I spy. It wasn't too entertaining towards the end of the trip, let me tell you. But we arrived in a small village outside Montpellier in a campsite with a tent already fixed, just a short walk from the beach. This was fantastic. My father had chosen this place because he wasn't one for crowds and it was slightly off the beaten track and promised small secluded beach areas with trees and rocks rather than rank and file sunbeds. And it was exactly that. Rocks to climb on, trees to swing in and small bays of soft golden sand, gentle waves and very few people. And then on the first day, it happened. That moment that makes a ten-year-old boy stop what he's doing and just stare. There was a woman with no top on. They didn't do that in Keithley. (laughs) I I ran to my dad to tell him, but it appeared he'd already noticed. (laughs) It's all right, son, he said, we're abroad. (laughs) As if it were absolutely nothing. And he looked out to sea as if there was something to look at, but I couldn't see it. I didn't know what to do. My younger brother wasn't in the least bit concerned. He just dug another hole and mum wasn't looking. She was looking at dad. 
So, I bet she was. So, if nobody else seemed alarmed, why should I be, says Jack. Well, over the next few days, it almost became normal. I have to tell you, there were some people who, I noticed, had forgotten all of their costume altogether. People of all ages, usually discreetly lounging under a tree in a private corner of the beach area. When I wanted to change my trunks, I had to have two parents holding a bath towel around me whilst ensuring there were no strangers within 50 feet. These people didn't seem to care. Anyway, the week drew on. We had a truly wonderful time. My father and I played frisbee on the beach while my younger brother just ran around aimlessly trying to catch it. As the frisbee came in my direction, I jumped to catch it but missed. It flew to the back of the beach, under the trees. So I ran to get it. It had landed just a few feet from a young couple, lounging sans clothes together. They were dozing in the shade. I approached quietly in the hope not to wake them. I bent down to pick up the frisbee but couldn't help glancing at the sight before me. The lady stirred and sat up. Miss Huxley, I shouted. <laughs> it was my form teacher. <laughs> well, <laughs> how I... <laughs> well, this was a coincidence. <laughs> oh, yes, it is. <laughs> how are you, miss? I said excitedly. <laughs> Miss Huxley went from horizontal to standing in about a quarter of a second and pulled the towel around her best she could. I'm very well, thank you, Jack, she said nervously. <laughs> I'm with my family over there, I said, and pointed to my father. I beckoned him to come closer. He wouldn't believe the coincidence. Miss Huxley and whoever the chat was made their excuses and packed up quietly. Bye, miss, I said politely and ran back. I didn't see Miss Huxley again during our last couple of days, which was a shame because she was a lovely teacher. So there it is, Simon. Miss Huxley did teach us for another year, but my genuine innocence meant that our relationship was completely unchanged. At least I thought it was. At the time, I said all the right things. It was just the polite thing to say hello. But of course, as I get older, I can see that it might not have been the right thing to do. So I beg forgiveness for my actions, not because I was a naughty boy, but because a lovely young lady had probably gone nowhere near uh, those kind of beaches in the 30 years since. Which you can entirely understand. What are the chances are that one of your pupils is playing frisbee on the same beach? I'm not sure about nature's confessions. I'm not asking for them. But anyway, uh, it's a jolly good tale from Jack the Accountant. What do you say, Sister Rebecca? Yeah, I'm, I remember meeting a teacher on holiday and it was um, awful in itself, let alone a teacher without any clothes on. So but that was must it, have been... This is a fully, fully, a fully clothed, clothed teacher. Fully clothed, yeah. But you never yes. want to come across them when you're on holiday, do you? Because not you're really. in a kind of different zone. Yes. So that must have been uh, mortifying for poor Jack. And he, it was just very sweet, actually, his in innocent response to the fact that she was lying there without any clothes on. And calling, her, calling his family over. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, have a guess. It's Miss Huxley. Come and have a look. I actually blame the dad dad because the dad obviously knew that they were on a nudist beach and um you know acted all surprised when he saw people without any clothes on and yet they continue to go there day I after day i think it was just a standard presumably. south of france beach oh was it, it? I think okay it was, it was just possibly. a regular well, possibly that's but, true yeah uh, so they're just abroad. i am gonna forgive jack but possibly not the dad for surrounding him mm -hmm. by naked people sister bobby from lovely, the lovely, lovely. What a lovely lad. What a lovely, well brought on lad. I don't know if I'd have reacted like that. I think I would have turned away and ran off screaming if I'd have seen Mr. Howley, the headmaster of uh, um, Wallace would, Scott would Junior have, School. Would that have been likely? Would Mr. Howley likely have stumbled upon oh, a corner a of a foreign beach? He was a lovely headmaster and I wouldn't like to. No, he was, no. Uh, he was. But I'm just saying, in my experience, I don't know that I've done the same. I'd have shot. So, well done. You're absolutely forgiven. Um, what a lovely story. Absolutely forgiven. Brother Matthew. Yeah, that's uh, absolutely put a smile on my face. Uh, what a great story. Um, uh, I, I think it is a little bit odd when you run into uh, teachers outside at all, in outside of any school, outside of the classroom. It's always a bit strange. Um, and, and this is, is, is brilliant. But uh, what a line. Oh, hello, Miss Huxley. <laughs> brilliant. Get us down over. Brilliant. Uh, so, yes, definitely forgiven. Well done. OK, so here's tonight's tale. Thank you very much indeed. Do we... Is there a certificate on this? Do we warn? Mm-hmm. PG? Is it another nudist? No. All oh, right. It's a, it's a... If you're eating or a kind of animal-friendly oh, animal lover... Even better. OK. Kind of thing. Uh, it comes from Richard Rabbit. Thank you, Richard. Father Simon and the Wise and Witty Collective. The story that is about to unfold takes place in the early 1970s and involves... Siblings, deceit, and family pets. I was brought up in the middle of three brothers, and our story takes place when we were 9, 12, and 14 years old. 
My mother despaired of the high levels of testosterone in our household and, having failed with my eldest brother and I, was determined that my younger brother, Tom, was to be a more caring and nurturing individual and that taking care of a pet would bring out his latent nurturing instincts. Previously, I had had a four-foot snake, which, as a public service announcement, I'd like to say, do not make for loving pets. Thank you for that. But for Tom, it was to be a rabbit. That's what he wanted. This would have been fine, but my mother, fearing one rabbit would not be enough, purchased two. And true to the spirit of living and growing, we were soon inundated with rabbits. It's like the birds and the bees, except with rabbits. With rabbits. Is that what it's called? And now we're going to talk about living and growing. <laughs> Sit down, everybody. Finally, my father decided he'd had enough of living, living in what was now essentially a very large warren. And it was deemed that the rabbits had to go. Tom, while not entirely happy, did agree on condition that the rabbits went to good homes. Adverts in the local press failed to produce any bunny sales and an offer to give them free to the local pet shop was also fruitless. Uh, rabbits had apparently been replaced by gerbils as the must-have pet of the year. One option remained, give them to the local zoo. Now, in the 70s, many small cities had their own little zoos, all of which seemed to have a petting area with sheep, goats and rabbits. On the face of it, this seemed an ideal solution with our rabbits rehoused in the petting zoo. Tom could visit them regularly. So we contacted the zoo to offer the rabbits for free and at last we were told that they would be delighted to take the rabbits. So my father and I took the bunnies to the zoo and met the keeper, a very nice man who seemed extremely enthusiastic to take Thumper and Co into what we could only imagine as a happy life in the petting zoo. However, as we were leaving at last free of the rabbits, the genial keeper did mention that he was not in fact the keeper of the petting zoo, but was in actual fact the keeper of the Australian dingo dog enclosure. Yep. Oh, no. The largest carnivorous animal yep. in the zoo. <laughs> this revelation raised some doubts about, about, what, about what the future may hold for Tom's rabbits. However, we had already given the bunnies to the zoo and we didn't want to take 10 plus rabbits back home so we left without asking further questions because as my father pointed out if we don't ask we won't be lying to Tom about what happened to the rabbits given the collectives and particularly brother Matt's previously stated position on lying to children I assume we're all good on this point when we returned home we remained true to our word and said nothing to Tom about the probable fate of his rabbits. So, Father Simon, while my father was more responsible than me for this deception, it is not forgiveness for him that I'm seeking, as in any case he felt so bad that he ended up buying my brother not one but two dogs in recompense and then inexplicably named them Muffin and Crumpet. But I digress. Father Simon, it is forgiveness for myself that I seek. Whilst I was a junior partner in this deception, for a long time afterwards, I would take my brother up to the zoo to see his rabbits, which I can, can confirm he never did. Now, whilst in this act in itself was commendable, I did somewhat spoil it by, while he was looking the other way, pointing into the pen, which was devoid of any rabbits at all, and said, look, there's Thumper. I just, oh, he's gone behind the hutch. <laughs> but he is there, really. Uh, Father Simon, this went on for much longer than I am proud of, but in my defence, I can confirm, 43 years on, Tom is not emotionally scarred by this, and I felt it was best in the intervening years to let sleeping dogs lie, no pun intended. So, Father Simon, it is with infinite regret that I ask for forgiveness from Tom and the ever wise uh, and witty collective. Sincerely, Richard Rabbit. I, I guess it was everything was very well intentioned, and they did think it was everything was going to be fine, and who knows, maybe it was. You know, it um, may be that the uh, the keeper of the Australian dingo dog enclosure. No, OK, no, it's, it's, a, it's a fair point. Anyway, uh, and then a couple of dogs called Muffin and Crumpet. Very strange uh, behaviour from Richard Rabbit. Uh, what do we say here, Sister Rebecca? I'm trying to work out uh, Richard's motivation for taking his little brother down to the, the petting zoo after this incident. Uh, I mean, was he trying to make him think that they were there, but he just couldn't see so. them? Or was he, he trying saying, to be cruel? They are. Oh, OK, can't... in that case, yes. you know, that was a good thing. Yes. I think it was actually the, the, the parents' fault. First of all, the mother, why did she need to get two rabbits? I mean, everyone knows that this, this is exactly what happens when you get two rabbits. And she could have just got one rabbit, that would have been fine. And also the Father, when he or a rabbit the... and a stick insect. Exactly. Maybe not in the same cage. Uh, but well, I think I... they'd be safe. Well, I don't know about the stick insect. Oh, no, fair enough. Uh, the dad <laughs> knew exactly what was going to happen to those rabbits when he left them in the petting zoo. So, uh, actually, it's the parents I don't forgive, but I do forgive Richard. 
What is it with stick insects? It's always got to be privet. That's the only thing that they eat. Never mind. Uh, have, you, have you got a pet? A stick insect? No, pet? we used. I used to have a stick insect, Did and you? then and then you know I forgot to get the privet, and it just privet. That's all they'll have with mustard. Yes. <laughs> Which they keep in the fridge. They do keep it in the fridge. <laughs> Apparently. Anyway, uh, Sister Bobby from the Priory. Well, I understand the circle of life, you know, everything's got to eat and all that. And I'm, we, I mean, we don't know what happened. We don't. We everything don't know could have been happened. fine. It could have absolutely been fine. But the thing is, they didn't make sure. And he did say as long as they go to good homes. Yes. And that wasn't a home that he had envisaged. Um, but I'm still confused. What happened to the snake? Where did the snake go? Well, the snake, he, well, earlier he had a four foot snake, but, yeah, we, but don't... we don't know what happened to the snake. Herring. That's a little bit of a worry, the really. It's a red herring. Um, it's a red herring. I, it's a snake. Honest, I think you shouldn't have left it with the Tinko dog. Do um, Matt, no, I think it was you, sh- you could have done better. You could have done better, and the rabbits did not forgive you. <laughs> Would you put a herring in the fridge? <laughs> if the herring, I'm so happy with that gag. That's all, that's all I, yeah, brilliant. Um, yes, yes, it is as as Bobby's uh, already pointed out. It is the circle of life. Who knows whether dingoes normally um, uh, go for rabbits? Dingoes I might look know. after. Them. Maybe they, they do. Might. None of us are experts on dingoes or rabbits. Um, uh, but uh, my guess is they don't get on. Do they coexist? There might uh, be a photograph maybe, of a dingo maybe and a rabbit in, getting on in the outback. You can find Fluffy and, the and the herring <laughs> and the uh, and the dingo. Um, but I I think not. I'm going to forgive because obviously uh, lying to the kids. Well done. Anyway, here comes tonight's confession. Thank you very much indeed. You can send yours to confessions at bbc.co.uk. Uh, tonight's comes from Steve. Father Simon, I seek redemption from you and your colleagues, not for myself, for I am blameless in this tale, but for my wife, who is not. May I begin by saying how much we enjoy your show in order to try to build up a few credits <laughs> and make up... Oh, outstanding. Well done. Make your forgiveness yeah, yeah. all the more likely. To celebrate <laughs> her eldest daughter's 21st birthday in 2012, my wife planned a celebratory trip to New York. Expense, no consideration. Business class tickets were procured using airline mileage points earned laboriously by me... And a great deal was found for a week's out-of-season stay at the Waldorf Astoria. Mm. It being early April, all proceeded beautifully. On the flight out from London via Madrid, they gorged on foie gras and champagne. Uh, Instantly lost a whole bunch of people. Mm, And they arrived tired, mm -hmm, but ready to explore the wonders of New York, which was new to them both. The sights were seen in their full magnificence, the top of the Empire State Building to celebrate the birthday child, Greenwich Village, a show at the Lincoln Centre, much else, and girls being girls, lots of shopping along the way. Towards the end of the week, thoughts settled momentarily on a gift for me. A decision was taken to purchase a tie from a renowned New York (laughs) purveyor of menswear. The weather, it should be said, was sunny but decidedly cool for April and sniffles that had developed in the plain were compounded by a walk through Central Park on the way to Fifth Avenue, where the shopping expedition largely for girls' wear led inexorably towards Brooks Brothers in search of a tie. Inside the store, which was well heated to welcome shoppers and put them at their ease, the sniffles became a little bit more extravagant and let's say they were snuffles by now. Is a snuffle bigger than a sniffle? Let's just assume that it is. At the tie counter, a well-dressed and attentive sales assistant produced an array of the finest silk ties to choose from, and he spread them across the counter. Wife and daughter applied their skills to choose colours and textures, which I have always considered the woman folk far better at than us men, and began to narrow down their choice. At that point, the helpful sales assistant, resplendent in three-piece suit himself, suggested they examine... Uh, their short list against the background of a finest Brooks Brothers blue shirt, blue being the usual colour of my own shirts. Well, my wife took up the challenge with enthusiasm and leant closer to the counter on which lay the shirt at a mere $350. Mm-hmm. And her list of ties, each considerably less pricey, but she placed the tie against the shirt just to consider which went best. At that moment, the snuffle in her nose, which I should have said this is not particularly good for people. <laughs> for Too late. At that moment, the snuffle in her nose, which had built up for several hours, I have to say, turned into a large drip. I shall go into no more details, which fell poignantly into the middle of the blue shirt arranged on the counter. Can a nose drip poignantly? 
Anyway, it was some big old splash. Mm. Nice. Missing the tie, but it left a very large wet splash mark on the shirt. Whether or not the sales assistant saw this is not clear. I think not, since there were many other purchases in the vicinity. My wife was mortified. Knowing her as I do, her instinct, I am sure, would have been to own up and offer to buy the shirt, or at least to launder it. But $350 was way beyond budget. Well, only because you've eaten foie gras champagne and flown business class to New York and stayed at the Waldorf Astoria, mm. one might add at this point. Instead, she seized the moment, left the shirt lying on the counter, grabbed a tie of her choosing and headed for the checkout where she paid for that and left the scene of the crime rapidly with daughter in tow. My wife's guilt has lived with her ever since. She seeks forgiveness. I have forgiven her since I got the tie. But is she entitled to more? Well, it's quite an interesting... Well, you know, what it's damaged goods, isn't it? If you damage the goods, I suppose you should probably uh, cough up. Or, well, to use an inappropriate <laughs> phrase... I've been worse than that. But, as you know, there's a, kind of a, there's a kind of a nasal thing happening. Big splash mark. What would you have done, Rebecca Pye? I mean, you've got a point about... Uh, they obviously uh, did uh, splash quite a lot of cash around and um, it would indicate that they should therefore be paying up for the shirt. But uh, I suppose any potential buyer should check the shirt before buying it. So if it has a stain on it, especially if it's costing that much money you'd check it wouldn't you and you'd probably so. see the stain and you'd ask for another one but the shop would have to take the uh, take the hit so it's not fair on the shop no. but I can see why she didn't fess up she felt a bit uh, strapped for cash after paying for the hotel and the <laughs> everything else so, champagne uh, so I'm going to forgive oh you're going to forgive yeah. okay so that's uh, that, that's one what are you thinking about well numbers? I think the retail dude the one trying to sell them was up upselling all the time bringing the 300, $350 for a shirt I obviously am <laughs> the wrong persuasion on that front. <laughs> uh, but also, who in their right... I mean, if that's the worst thing she's ever done, Father Simon, is that she's got a bit of nose drip has gone onto a shirt. Well, you know... It's, it's clearly it's clearly not just the tiniest. Well, even so, I mean, there you go. I mean, she, I don't know how many people would have said, oh, sorry, I'm just, you know, on your shirt when no-one noticed it. I really don't... I mean, they've, they've got a, a cleaning margin is built in, obviously, at $350 a shirt. So, so you would on have this occasion, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'd have, I would have, I'd have... She bought a, a tie, but that wasn't cheap either. Or at least she might have bought more than one. So I think she did really well. So well done to her, you know. And, and Steve, for uh, doing all the air mile stuff, he's yeah. definitely forgiven. And his missus, on this occasion, yes, who wouldn't? Okay. I've just walked away. All right, Matt, would you have walked out? Yeah. Oh, he wouldn't have seen me for <laughs> dust. Please. $350 for a shirt. Are you joking? Well, they didn't buy it. They were buying it. Well, exactly, yeah. But still, the kind of store that charges $350 for a shirt. <laughs> unbelievable. Um, why, so, is it, why is that unbelievable? That's un because it's a shirt. $350. What Please. Is what, what is that in real money? That's for like 180 like, two, two, um, two, 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 I'm only working euros. £220. £220. <laughs> it's made out of woven gold, which it's has been, been plucked made from an ass. Martian dust. Oh, it's got a bit of extra <laughs> on um, it now as well. Uh, yes, so I am definitely going to forgive because we'd have all done. And anyone who says they wouldn't have done it is lying. It's got silver buttons. They, we'd all have done it. And stupid. Yes. And they, ladies and gentlemen of the collective, were this week's confessions. Did you forgive anybody? If you have a shadowy secret, if you have a confession to tell, now is the time. We have our own email address, confessions at bbc.co.uk. More in a week, and don't forget you can listen to our guest interviews online. This week, David Mitchell was in the Radio 2 book club. Not the comedian one, the clever writery one. Casey Musgraves regaled us with Tales of Texas. And Sophia Helen, who is Saga from the bridge, uh, was in and turning a few heads. Well, turning my head. There you go. Privileges of being on the show. See the photographs online. Uh, thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank you for downloading. And we'll do another one next week. 